this is the, the most important step here with this goal is to lift weights. The reason why you want to lift weights or do strength training is because that is the most effective, loudest muscle building type signal that you can send your body. If you do not lift weights and you attempt to build muscle and burn body fat, you're not going it's not going to happen. You may burn some body fat, but you ain't going to build muscle. Muscle does not appear on your body without a stimulus, without a reason for it because it is expensive tissue, meaning it costs your body nutrients to build and then maintain muscle. And without a good reason, your body will never add muscle to your body. And what I mean by a good reason is either a strong outside signal or a hormonal signal or some kind of a signal that says we want extra muscle. Otherwise, it ain't going to happen. So you have to, if this is your goal, if you don't lift weights, it ain't going to happen. No other form of exercise will allow you, and there's more steps, but will allow you to build muscle and burn body fat. Uh, like lifting weights well. Absolutely has to happen. Well, and then, okay, along those lines, the, your your second point would be the, the type of, of lifting you do, I think is really important too, yes. because a lot of times, especially people that are wanting to reduce body fat, um, they get caught up in the, the calorie burn type of, mm -hmm. of training and okay. get focused more on this like circuit-based, high heart rate, constantly moving, constantly sweating, and for what we're trying to accomplish here, I would say that's some of the worst ways you yes, could yeah. potentially train, right? Yep. Yeah, no, you got to focus on the loudest possible signal for muscle building exclusively. And there's a couple of those lifts, those compound lifts that really provide, you know, that uh, uh, that kind of stimulus where, you're, where your whole body is just, you know, geared in that direction towards yeah. muscle building. Yeah, so like, for example, a barbell squat in a set to set comparison to like leg extensions <clears throat> or leg curls or other leg exercises, it just builds more muscle. So it's it's a louder muscle building signal. And you want as loud of a possible, uh, as a loud as possible muscle building signal in this process. So those exercises do that. But also there's this problem. Because my calories are going to be carefully, you know, tracked or I'm cutting calories, I can't waste time and energy doing stuff that's not really going to serve me really well. You got to view your workout as the signaling for muscle and the diet as this is the fat burning part of it. Don't look at your workout as the yeah. fat burning. Although the workout does contribute to it, don't view it that way because if you start to train to burn body fat, then you're going to burn too many calories uh, or send the wrong signal, which is more of a risk actually. And then your body will actually pare muscle down. It's very common for people to go lower calorie to lose weight and simultaneously lose muscle as well as body fat. In fact, that's more common than not. Well, this is also the reason why I, during this process, I did no cardio. Yeah. And it, that's well, the most controversial part right now. It is controversial, but I mean, I love that you recently brought up, uh, that study that they just did. Yeah. And this is an example of that. If you are in a deficit and trying to lean out and you're lifting weights and you're simultaneously also doing, you know, hour bouts of, of cardio in your regimen, it is very difficult for you to lean out and also maintain the most amount of muscle that you that you can and that's that's why so it's like if my if i know that muscle is going to help me metabolically i know that ultimately that's the look i also want to have is i want to have a lean muscular look i don't want to be all just skinny from right. losing lots of weight then it's important that I keep as much muscle as possible in this process. And one of the ways of doing that is actually managing your deficit purely through your nutrition and your training and not through cardio. Cardio does not send a muscle building signal. Cardio sends a build endurance signal, and it also burns a lot of calories during the time that you're spent doing it. So because it doesn't send a muscle building signal and because it burns a lot of calories, the way your body adapts to it is by making you more efficient, giving you more endurance, but also making you more efficient with calorie burn. So you mm -hmm. end up losing muscle. You end up paring muscle down. Cardio will send a competing signal with the strength training. So could you lose more weight on the scale, total weight, by doing cardio plus weights plus a deficit in calories? Yes. Will you lose more fat? No. Will you build muscle? Definitely not. So remember, the goal here is to build muscle and burn body fat at the same time. And because it's such a tricky, this is such a tricky... Goldilocks zone process. You don't want to do anything that could potentially get your body to pare muscle down. You want to do everything yeah. in your power to try to get your body to build muscle while simultaneously eating in a calorie deficit to, to burn body fat. Yeah. And if you don't, then your body will adapt metabolically by reducing muscle. And you'll end up in, in what usually happens, which is I lost fat and I lost some muscle. Now, what is it, Sal, about walking that doesn't seem to do this? 
Right? Now you so can the, walk a lot and do this, like right. tons. Yeah. But if you just, you know, make sure that you're active throughout the day and taking, you know, eight to ten thousand, twelve thousand steps a day, you're not really needing to build tons of stamina and endurance. It's really just about being active and being healthy. Right. Cardio on a cardio machine where you're going for it and you're burnt and you're sweating and you're elevating your heart workout. rate. Yeah. Now you're looking at like, or running outside or something like that. Now you're looking at, oh, now my body really wants to become efficient. Now you can do this with walking. It's just a lot harder. You have to walk miles and miles and miles a day to make well, that the happen. the thing about walking versus um, running, jogging, all that, like it's more recovery focused. So it, it's good for overall digestion. It's good for overall circulation. And that whole circulation process, you know, aids really well with recovery, which then helps in the process of building muscle. Yes. And is that because of it, it, it because it's more recovery, um, you, you manage your heart rate relatively low is, is the body not receiving this kind of loud signal of endurance or push, Correct. right? Like, whereas I get on a piece of cardio equipment, I mean, the, the, the signals are heart rates elevating, starting to sweat, lose, uh, having a hard time breathing. Like, and so yeah. I feel like the body kind of reacts. Yeah. That's the environment you're presenting it. Yeah. Right. More so aggressively to, to that versus if for I'm just kind of moving throughout my day. My body's not like freaking out like, oh God, or how long are we going to be doing this for? Or this is so difficult. Oh my God, we need so much more calories. There's a, there's a big right. difference between going on a stroll, which is what we're talking about, and doing something cardiovascularly to where my body needs to improve its endurance. So I recommend you go on daily walks and strolls to where it's a walk, like you're going out with your friend and having a conversation. Not like I'm out to go do a workout. Yeah. That's not what we're talking about. The workout is a strength training. That's what's going to make this happen. It's almost parasympathetic, right? Yes. Like you're, you're bringing that heart rate down, controllable, totally. and it's recovery-based. Totally. Next is, uh, so obviously you have to be in a calorie deficit to have the fat loss happen, but you don't want to be in too much of a deficit because we need to have enough nutrients and calories to fuel muscle building. So what you want to do is you want to eat in a very small deficit. So I want to ask you, Adam, when you were tracking this for yourself, what was your goal Deficit wise, you know, it, honestly, Sal, I actually didn't really focus so much on the deficit as much as I did like hitting my tar targets and not overeating. Got it. Right. So, because I knew through walking and my, me training and stuff like that, that I was already going to create somewhat of a, a deficit through that naturally because of the activity that I was doing and then the signal that I'm sending my body that it needs extra calories to build muscle. So I actually wanted to kind of hover around a maintenance more than I wanted a deficit. And what would naturally happen is as I built more muscle, my m metabolism would speed up, which would then would take care of, of you know, creating a, new, a yeah. new deficit. So I actually was more focused on actually hitting my macro targets, not actually restricting. I knew that as we, I built muscle, as I continued to work out in the gym and move, that I would, I would slowly create that. And then what I was actually more watching was is my weight starting to drop too fast? Oh, I need to add calories again. That's great. So it was actually like, okay, hitting a maintenance, letting the strength training build the muscle to build the metabolism. And then once the metabolism started to build enough to where I actually started to see a dip in the on the scale or see my weight going down, then I would actually increase calories. So I did more of this like staying at maintenance, slight surplus, maintenance, slight surplus process of, of actually eating but actually was leaning out. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. great. So when I say small deficit, what I was going to say is like, you're aiming for like a 100 calorie deficit, which is probably going to come out to like maintenance. Which is exactly what's probably happening. Yes, right? yes, Obviously, yes. I was in somewhat of a deficit, but the 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 psychological or the mindset- Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. Was like, hit what my body needs. This is what, you know, this is what I've figured out is my, my caloric maintenance. This is how much protein and fats my body needs. I'm going to stay right in that zone or close to that as I possibly can. I know that if I'm just really getting started back into weight training, that I'm going to start lifting these weights and it's going to send a signal to build muscle. And I'm going to need that potential, maybe even surplus of calories to build. And then what will eventually happen is that I add one, two pounds of muscle, the metabolism will speed up. And then I'll start to see the scale go down or me leaning out. And then that was always my indicator of, oh, time to add more calories. That's awesome. That's mm -hmm. why the next one is to interrupt with some small calorie surpluses. Exactly what you did, right? Where mm -hmm. I would go, I would recommend someone do like five days or six days of a tiny deficit, which almost feels like maintenance, and then a day where you're now in a slight surplus. So 100 below, and then maybe 100 or 200 above for a day, and then back to below. And then, of course, reassessing, because as, as you continue to reassess, if you're doing this right and gaining muscle, because at the end of your journey, your metabolism was faster. Oh, my God, yeah. yeah. No, I think when I started, <clears throat> I was eating around, I think about 2,800 and 
I, I don't know. I can't remember exactly what, but I believe it was right around 2,800 to 3,000 calories was about where my maintenance was. And then by the end of this, I was over 4,000. Wow. So, and that was just, and very slowly, man, it was almost a year later. I'm so glad you said that because yeah. had you stayed at 2,800, it wouldn't happen. Oh, definitely not. I yeah. definitely would not have built muscle. I mean, I might've slowly kind of leaned out, but if I did not, if I did not get to a place where I was eating that many calories, I would not have also added the muscle that I had mm -hmm. to speed the metabolism. Was that a psychological challenge? Because I know a lot of people that go through like that surplus mode and then they interrupt it to, you know, break it up and do like a Bro, it was and they come it, right back. It was un it was such a mind fuck, but it also was one of the coolest experiences for me for being a better coach because I I was so dialed in on where my macros needed to be that I knew I was doing the right things, right? But then there would be moments where I would get this feedback of I'd wake up in the morning and I'd look a little bloated or I'd look like I didn't get leaner. I look like I look like I got fatter overnight or what seemed to be it felt like overnight and then i'd actually get on the scale and maybe even see the scale had gone up a pound or two wow and so it really challenged that oh my god you know do i know what i'm doing am i eating appropriate to what, I, what i'm training like and oh should i cut and what i do is like no I'm, I, I have to trust the process i have to know that i know that I'm, i've already calculated all this out I, i'm in the right place and then it would be like two or three days later all of a sudden you'd see that yeah. come out and what it was was my body just holding on to water hmm. and that little bit of holding on to water while you're also trying to lean out is such a mind fuck. and so it really opened my eyes for from a coaching perspective of God, how often does this happen to our people? Oh yeah. How often do you, you abandon it because of those signals? Yes. Right? And, and, and you know what, when you're, when you're in that position, this is from like the client's perspective, I don't care how smart your trainer is or how much you trust them. There's nothing they can say to you to make you feel different yeah. about what you see, because I, I, I knew what I was doing, knew it was right, but would see it. And it still messed with me. Cause I'm going like, no, I, I'm looking at this mirror right now and I know what I look like yesterday and I look worse today mm -hmm. yet. I trained, I ate the way I was supposed to, but I woke up. And so, you know, the, the, your body's ability to retain and hold water and to look a little bit different day to day, uh, can be very deceiving for the, the, I mean, even the experienced person, uh, much less the, a the average yeah. person who's going through this. I like so. that. Yeah. So that's, I'm so glad you said that. So basically, you're going for a small deficit most of the time. And every once in a while, you do a small surplus. But the key here is it's small, there's nothing massive um, in either direction. Now, along those lines, um, you definitely want to eat a very high protein diet one gram of protein per pound of body weight, or even a little more. Yeah. Studies are pretty clear on this. When people are in a calorie deficit, but their protein intake is high, even if they don't strength train, they lose less muscle. If they strength train, they end up building more muscle. So the protein aspect is going to be very, very important. So take your body weight and say, okay, that's my goal to hit that many grams of protein per day. And that'll make a huge difference. Of all the macronutrients, that one makes the biggest difference. Well, this is so important, right? So that if I, let's say I'm hitting my calorie goal in order to quote unquote build muscle, but my protein take is so low, my body might not, right? That's right. I mean, like, so I could literally, let's say my, my number is, you know, 2,900 calories is what I need, uh, I need to consume it. And I hit my 2,900, but my protein's at 30 grams or 50 grams. The likelihood that the extra weight that my body potentially holds on to or adds is not going to be that's right it's not going to be muscle because i'm not giving it the the right macronutrients in order for it to adapt and build muscle but i am giving it a surplus of calories so those actual additional calories may end up getting stored as body fat is that right that's it yeah muscle your, your muscles are made up of amino acids now there's the, the fat and carbohydrates play a role um because it's more complex than what i'm saying but uh this is pretty clear this is one of those things with diet because diet can be murky but this is very clear in diet that a high protein intake in a calorie deficit is phenomenal for muscle. And since we're talking about building muscle while burning body fat, like you got, you absolutely have to do this um, to really make this a reality again, because it's so challenging. The next thing is we're going to talk about our carbs. Carb cycling can be really valuable during this process. Now it's mainly because when you're looking at your total calories, especially if you're trying to be in a small uh, deficit, Calories are made up of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Well, proteins and fats are essential. 
meaning you need to have a certain amount of each just to thrive and survive. <clears throat> Carbohydrates are not essential. So when you're cutting calories, it's easier to take them from carbs because you're you're not going to take it away from you're not taking away anything your body absolutely needs like you would from fat and proteins. Now, what is carb cycling? Carb cycling is the process of feeding yourself your carbohydrates around your workouts, for example, mm -hmm. to fuel your workouts. Usable energy. Yeah, this is, what I, energy. this is how I would like to do it, right? I like to eat my carbohydrates a couple hours before my workout so I have the fuel during the workout to fuel the strength building, muscle building process. And then maybe the rest of the day, my carbohydrates are lower because my calories are, are lower uh, overall. That's one of the main ways. That so when I did this... Um, the way it ended up working out was like my medium carb day was basically caloric maintenance. My low carb day was a deficit. And then my high uh, carb day was a slight surplus. So proteins and fats are almost the same. That's right. Proteins okay. and fats are the same. Carbs is what I manipulated. The carbohydrates also was what had me undulate my calories. Mm -hmm. And so I found that's another reason why I really liked it. Was It was an easy way to actually do that and just by following these macros mm -hmm. and i'd have these days where i'd get this uh, as the carb surplus obviously love those days because i'm eating additional calories uh that would fuel these great workouts i also tried and scheduled the big like leg day training stuff that i would do uh right around that so i had this extra energy from it that would put me in a surplus hopefully my body is building and adding muscle from the surplus of calories then i go back down to a, a a maintenance day and then i'd have this low and i actually cite like and there's different by the way there's different ways to carb cycle i played with all of them i used to run two low days a medium day and then a high day mm. So that's kind of like what mine ended up looking like. Well, I like this too with the manipulating the carbs specifically because then on the low days too, you're still like satiated when you are high protein. Yeah. And that for me was like so much more manageable. My hunger signal didn't get too loud and, and I wasn't fighting that as much. Yeah. Totally. Next up is to prioritize sleep. Here's why. Probably the most effective way to build fat and burn muscle or lose muscle is to have crappy sleep. Losing sleep is a tremendous stress on the body. And evolutionarily speaking, if you weren't getting enough sleep, it was probably because you had to look for food. It's probably because food was scarce. Otherwise, your body, I mean, we need sleep. We absolutely need sleep. Uh, sleep would have been uh, you know, ruled out a long time ago if it wasn't absolutely a necessity because you're unconscious for however many hours of the night making yourself quite vulnerable. So it's something that you need. And if you're not getting it, through most of human evolution, it probably meant like we weren't getting, I wasn't getting enough food. I need to be up trying to find more food. So because of that stress, your body tries to slow its metabolism down. It's like, okay, well, we, we can't find food probably. Let's reduce our metabolic rate. And one of the best ways to do that is to pare muscle down. Also, let's hold on to some insurance because body fat is insurance. More body fat means you can survive with less food for longer. So your body actually, what it does when you lose sleep is it modifies its hormone profile to get rid of muscle and to burn, uh, yeah. to build body fat. It also will change your cravings to do so. You'll notice after one night of poor sleep, you crave foods, you have uh, more of a sweet tooth, more palatable foods or things that you want, both because they make you feel better, but also because your body's trying to get you to eat more because of that stress. So poor sleep will kill this 100%. You got to yeah. prioritize it. I can't help but think uh, and refer back to when we were speculating about uh, why all these bodybuilders were just getting massive and um, they would go to that place in the Middle East. Yes. Um, and we thought that maybe there's some crazy myostatin they're on or oh, whatever. Yeah. But really the kept the feedback was that, you know, yes, you know, some they're on anabolics, but really what what transcended their physique was the fact they're so regimented with their sleep yeah. and they're so regimented with their nutrition and it's like completely scheduled and dialed in there with no interruption. Oh, is it would you say it's fair to say that um, getting good sleep is one of the best ways to naturally potentially um, optimize your hormones and yes. getting poor sleep is one of the easiest ways for you to disrupt your hormonal balance. So fast. One night of bad sleep will change your hormone profile. So when you think about the role that hormones play in building muscle and fat loss and energy and all these things, and when you understand that, right, that plays a key role, right, to you being able to build muscle or lose body fat, 
And then you, then you understand that sleep is one of the, the easiest ways to improve that. And one of the easiest ways to disrupt that you start to realize like, oh, wow, like if I'm not thinking about that as a one of my key priorities in really balancing this whole diet, lifting, training thing, mm -hmm. out, I'm missing out on one of the biggest things that could impact my results. Right? Completely. 100%. This has got to be a big, this is, when I say prioritize, we mean like every day. Not like, yeah, Monday through Thursday, and then Friday and I go to bed late, wake up late Saturday, so I have jet lag, and then Sunday, and then... No, no, no. Prioritize means every single night, because even one or two nights of really bad sleep um, will wreak havoc on this particular goal. So this has to be as prioritized as the consistency that you're lifting weights or the consistency with your diet. It's literally up there with being just as important, if not more important, because bad sleep will affect you yeah. negatively more. No room for error. Then, yeah, then, then, then poor. Like you could have one bad day of eating; it will not negatively impact you as much as one bad night uh, of sleep. Well, I think you brought this up, right? And I don't remember if you were referring to someone else talking to you about it or your your own research was that when you have, like, let's say you have like perfect, you go to bed at nine thirty yeah. every night, Monday through Friday, but then Saturday. You're out at the club till two in the morning or whatever. It's like literally like you're jet lagged it for is. the next two days trying to get that circadian rhythm back to normal. It again. is a three or four hour difference when you travel puts you in jet lag, right? Two hour difference will put you in a little bit of jet lag. Well, that's what people do every week. Every week they go to bed at a certain time and then Friday night or Saturday night comes, they go to bed late and they say, well, I'll sleep in the next day to make up for it. Well, you make up for it for a little bit, but what you're really doing is you're you're messing with your circadian rhythm. Monday comes around. That's why everybody hates Monday. Yeah. Monday comes around. Got to get back on schedule. Why do I feel like dog shit? Well, it's like you came from a, you, like you're traveling. You came from another country yeah. and you're behind by three or four hours and it takes two or three days just to catch up. And that definitely messes with your hormones. So this has to be like seven days a week. Uh, next up. Now this is one of the least important things, but uh, this can help a little bit. And there are some supplements that can help with this process of building muscle and burning body fat. Really what these supplements do more than the fat burning is just the building muscle. Mm. Fat burning supplements, you can pretty much throw them in the garbage. <laughs> um, there really isn't anything out there that burns body fat. Some supplements out there might, might suppress your appetite for a bit, which can help. But really what you're looking at are muscle building supplements. And the number one muscle building supplement that's out there that's been tested thousands of times is creatine. Mm -hmm. And studies show when people diet and take creatine versus diet and don't take creatine, they keep more muscle. Now, the one thing I will add to that, though, is this, is supplementing for areas where you're deficient can be incredibly oh, impactful. Yeah, good point. For example, nutrient deficiencies, right? magnesium was life-changing for me for getting better sleep. Yeah. Like, and we talk about how important sleep is, learning that I was, uh, you know, deficient in magnesium and then taking the mellow every single night made a huge impact on my sleep. Vitamin D, vitamin right? D, if you're somebody who's for very, for me. very low on vitamin D. So, so I think at the point your Sal's making is that, you know, all these fat burner, muscle building, you know, gimmicky type of performance supplements that are out there are really worth nothing in this pursuit. But what has value is your your overall balance of nutrients that your body actually needs to be functioning. Yeah, right? that's a great point. I didn't even mm -hmm. think of that. Yeah, if, if you get uh, like a test to see if you have any nutrient deficiencies and you find any of them, that'll be a game changer because essential nutrients are essential for functions of the body, including hormone production, you know, fat loss, muscle building, health, immune system, pretty much everything. So if your vitamin D level is low, if your magnesium is low, if, if there's a, a iron is low, supplementing with those can definitely be a game changer. Now, on top of that, supplements like creatine can help because creatine is very, very pro-muscle and indirectly anti-fat because of the muscle building process. Another supplement that helps is hydroxymethylbutyrate, known as HMB. This is uh, closely related to um, leucine. It is a... a, a, a some, it's not an amino acid, but it re resembles an amino acid, and it is pro-muscle sparing. In fact, they now put HMB in um, meal replacement shakes in like uh, those retirement homes to prevent muscle wasting for older people. It's actually quite well studied. It's nothing groundbreaking. You're not going to take HMB and notice, but it may help you or prevent you from losing muscle if you start to mess up the, the calorie balance a little bit. And then branched amino acids can kind of do... The same thing. Although I will say this, if your protein's high enough, yeah, then it's pretty irrelevant the value of, of branched amino acids and HMB starts to decline. Creatine's still valuable, but those two, uh, not so much. Yeah. Now, the last step, this is important because as Adam was explaining, this is like a, 
This is a constantly changing process. At the beginning of his fat loss, muscle building, stay the same weight journey, his his metabolism was 2,800 or 2,900 calories. At the end, it was 4,000 calories. The only way to know how that's working for you is if you test your body fat percentage weekly, gauge your process on a weekly basis, then you know what levers to pull, right? Then you know if the calories are too high. Ooh, I gained muscle, but I also gained body fat. So let me drop the calories a little bit. Or, ooh, I lost body fat, no muscle. In fact, I lost a little muscle. Let me raise the calories a little bit. This is a touchy process every single week because if you are building muscle and burning body fat, metabolism is changing, meaning your diet has to change uh, as well. So this was the rule that I came up for myself. It was, I tested every week. I took pictures every week. Same time, same day, fr Fridays, first thing in the morning, always. But I would not adjust anything in my programming until two weeks. So I, ne no matter what oh, happened, good point. so I never, whether I, if I didn't like what I was seeing or I thought my progress had stalled, um, I, I never made a correction to the plan that I had set out until two, a good two weeks. And it was just what I had found. you're looking for a trend, right? That's right. I, yeah. I needed, I need a, a week is not quite enough when you're talking about how slow the body builds muscle and burns body fat. Um, a, a week isn't quite enough for me to get enough analytics to make a real educated decision on which way I could go. And ease, and you guys know from body fat testing, you know, they can be off a little bit. And so a little bit up or a little bit down and just in seven days could really throw me off on, on overcorrecting. So I would always, uh, I would still track every week, but I wouldn't make corrections and changes in the nutrition and the training until two weeks it and then i then i could be a little more objective like okay here's my pictures two weeks ago here's my pictures to now here's where my body fat percentage was two weeks ago here it is now like okay now let's let's make a decision based off of that versus every single yeah week. the part that you said is real important is that you body fat tests aren't i mean it's impossible yeah, for them to be not total. perfect no this could be user error if it's electronic impedance i mean then you have even more factors that can make it inaccurate so let's say you did a body fat test and it went up a half percent, which is like, I mean, statistically you could error up to one or 2%, right? You probably shouldn't change anything. Now, if you go the next week, it's up another half percent. Well, okay, now I know. But if it's back down, you're like, okay, it was obviously a mistake. Which is why I also like to pair it with the pictures because sometimes what might've happened is I didn't see much body fat change, but then I would see my pictures. I'm like, oh, I, I, I like the direction I'm yeah. going. I can see... In that two weeks, like I'm making improvements. Oh, I see my shoulders are coming out a little more. I see my waistline's coming in a little bit. Like, okay, I like what I'm seeing. And even though the body fat percentage isn't showing me anything super positive, it's not negative. And what I see, I like, I'm going to stay the course. So, or vice versa could happen, right? You could be like, oh yeah, I think the, the pictures look terrible I'm, or they look the same from two weeks ago. But then, oh wow, when I do my reading, it says I'm right on course with my body fat percentage. So, you know, stay the course. So, I think using both of them to make kind of an objective decision around like, you know, so because I think the biggest mistake that people make when you're trying to do something in the, like the Goldilocks zone is is to uh, make a, a decision too soon. Uh, mm -hmm. That's yeah. that's too drastic. Patience and, is so important with this. Yeah, yeah. you have your and you're bet like it's not going to kill you if you're if you're kind of stalled and you're not seeing the progress you'd like to see. Doing another week or two, staying right there, it's not going to hurt you. And what I found more often than not was trusting that process and staying right there for another two weeks. The next two weeks, I made big leaps. Kind of weird how the body works like yeah. that. Like it's kind of like how we talk about how kids grow right. when they're when they're little. It's like yeah. it's not like they grew three in uh, three There's inches. There's some resistance there. Your body, yeah. Has. Well, like, sometimes they'll have like no growth, right? You yeah. remember it's the, all they, spurts. Yeah, and then all of a sudden there's a spurt where like, and the, I felt the same way about the, hundred percent the, the pursuit of building muscle and losing body fat is like you know sometimes I'd have just not a great week, but my eating was perfect, my training was perfect, but mm -hmm. then the results were kind of meh. But then the next week comes and it was like oh wow, I felt like I made a big it was leap, like a release. Yeah. So I would always err on the side of hey, I can stick this out for another two weeks to give it to, a, a chance to show me the results versus, oh man, I didn't move very much this week. Oh, drop calories more or oh, pick up this. Yeah. And it's like, when I did that, I felt like I always ended up overcorrecting. So when you're in this process and you you feel stalled, don't, you know, test it for another week or two. 
It is not going to hurt you to stay at those calories, to stay consistent with the way you're training for two more weeks to give your body the opportunity to take one of those leaps. Because then what you might find is then the next two you're weeks. You're on the right track. You're like, oh, wow, this was great. Love you know? it. Cardio training is a terrible way to lose body fat. Look, cardio can be healthy. It's amazing for stamina and endurance. But for fat loss, it just plain sucks. We've been saying this for years here at Mind Pump. Well, a study just came out that proved what we've been saying has been right all along. They did a study where they compared cardio versus strength training versus cardio plus strength training. Guess what performed the best? Strength training alone. <gasps> ding, 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 People ding. who did strength training alone had more muscle and more body fat than people who did cardio, for sure, and even a little bit better than people who combined cardio with strength training. So when it comes to fat loss, just do strength training. If you want to improve endurance and stamina, that's fine. Do cardio. But when it comes to fat loss, stop it, guys. Stop telling everybody to do cardio. It's a terrible program. Oh, boy. We're all the fitness clowns that were uh, trying to counter that conversation. Can I just, can I just tell you that, because uh, we've been saying this for almost a decade on the yeah. show. Almost yeah. a, For as long as we've been on the show, we've been saying this. Religiously. And this is the message that probably gets attacked the most yeah, by us. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's the fitness influencers. It's the, you know, the bros. It's the whoever. It's, they're just married to that card. They're trying. They try so hard to take us down. And through the years, we've been proven right on many different subjects. And this one, uh, they haven't. There's studies that show that, you know, lean in the direction that we're talking. But this is the first one that showed cardio versus strength training versus strength training plus cardio. Yeah. And in that study, the strength training actually did a little bit better than the combination, which is pretty crazy. But it does go right along with the, what we explained with the mixed messages and signaling that you're sending the body and how cardio, yes, it burns more calories while you're doing it, but it actually teaches your body to become more efficient. It actually teaches your body to slow down its metabolism. Um, over time, and our theory is the evolutionary yeah. one. Nonetheless, it's proven. It's, it's there. You I go. think that's the most significant part is yeah. it, you know knowing that um, in combination with uh, resistance training and cardio didn't it even outperformed no. that. And so it's like okay, because that would have been a point of contention that I'm sure like most yes. trainers and coaches would have brought in. Well, yes. in conjunction together, you're gonna probably have. The yeah, best why outcome. wouldn't you do both? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's been the argument and the challenge I've had in the competitive world since I got into that. I mean, it's still happening right now. It's also how I, when people ask me like, oh, how do I know if I have a good coach or not? I'm like, well, your coach sucks if the first thing he does is put you on cardio to start off your fat loss journey. If you are in a six, nine, 12, 18 week prep for a show and you're already doing cardio in the first couple of weeks, he sucks yeah. or she sucks, whoever's telling you to do that. Because for this exact reason right here, especially in on the competitive level when it is your job to hang on to as much muscle yep. as you can to present the best buff version of yourself on stage like that because if this is somebody who is like the average person and you want to have good cardio endurance and and heart health and you also want to lean out a little bit and you want to be strong Just include like, more movement in general yeah and, and even then it's like it's not a big deal if you lose a couple pounds of muscle i mean i guess i mean if you lose 15 pounds and five to seven uh, pounds of muscle also comes off of that. You don't really care then. Okay, whatever. But if you're in the business of keeping as much muscle as you possibly can and only reducing body fat, using cardio is a stupid strategy. A hundred percent. Look, cardio is the best, one of the best ways to improve stamina and endurance. Fact. Like if you're yeah. an athlete and you come to me and you say, you know, I want to uh, get better at distance running or I want more gas in the tank for my particular sport Strength training definitely helps, but cardio, that's your go-to. Stamina and endurance, that's your go-to. It also, when appro applied appropriately and properly, is good for you. So there's nothing wrong with it. <clears throat> but when it comes to just fat loss, in the context of just fat loss, okay? By the way, when you're talking about the average person, and we're talking about their health, like athletic conditioning is important. When we talk about the average person, what you want them to do is you need them to lose body fat, and you need them to have muscle. In fact, in this study, the other part of this study, is they measured uh, H, uh, let me read this to you. So they were measuring also how the body responded to, to insulin or blood glucose, HbA1c levels. That's directly connected to muscle mass. So uh, if you want insulin sensitivity, you're not gonna be able to work out all the time. 
um, and you're only going to pick for one form of exercise, like make it, make it strength training by far is, yeah. is the most effective. But I mean, again, what's crazy about this is it even out, it, I mean, it was a small outperformance in combination, but think about it. They did more work. Yeah. I was going to say, think yeah. about that. You're like, yeah. why would you do more work for less results? Yeah, exactly. That makes yeah. no sense. Like the argument was like, oh, it, it's just as good or maybe a little bit better potentially. It's not, no. <laughs> it's worse. No. So why would you actually spend more time putting, and for the people that are like trying to make the argument of the heart health thing, go interrupt your regular five by five training with 20 sets of squats and deadlifts and overhead presses. Yeah. Yeah. You want, watch how your heart gets pounding and how strong yeah. it gets yeah. from training that way. You do a cycle of that, do a cycle of training where you're doing 20 rep ranges or supersetting or giant sets. And I promise you're going to be in pretty damn good cardiovascular health. I remember I told you guys a story when I made the bet with my, my, there's two of us and I was like meathead training like crazy, but I was training hard, you know, and I was training a lot of stuff where I was doing supersets and I knew I was in good condition. You know, I wasn't in the best running condition, but I was in enough running condition to beat the shit out of my friends who were training, running all the yeah. time to get in shape for this little bike, whatever the uh, muddy buddy marathon thing oh, yeah. that we did. And it's like, you'd be amazed on how good of endurance that you can get if you train that way, even with weights. And mm -hmm. so this idea that you need to get on a hamster wheel and run really hard till you can't breathe. And that's the best way for you to lose fat and or the best way for you to get just endurance. It's not, there's plenty of ways to do that through strength training. It, it, well, I mean, look, if you were to look at, you know, health and longevity, we'll put that in a category. So health, longevity, performance, uh, and athletic performance, what, you know, there's a lot of crossover there, right? But then there's the extremes, right? You can push performance to where you're taking away from health and longevity. And then of course, if, you know, health and longevity, if you're maximizing that, you're not maximizing performance. When we're talking about athletic performance, now we're looking at all the tools and we're looking at how to use them the best way. Okay. That's, that's, that's a fact. But the average person, the average person listening to this podcast is like, I got three days a week to work out. Yeah. I want to get lean. I want to feel good. And I don't have tons of time that I can spend at the gym. What do I do? I have 45 minutes to an hour, three days a week. Strength train, strength train. What about the days off? Walk more. You've got it. That's it. That's like 95%. Yeah. Most everybody down. wants to be healthy, fit, strong, and have flexibility in their diet and look good, right? Those are like the five yeah. core tenets that you get from almost every single person that's ever hired me are those. Mm -hmm. You get the occasional one out of a hundred that is a very specific athlete or competition or right. thing that we're trying to do. Like that's so rare. Almost everybody listening will fall in those five categories. And the best way to do that is through weight training yeah. and mm -hmm. proper diet. Those two things will give you all five of those attributes. Talk about the good timing too yep. for Dr. Lyon's book, uh, which, which oh, released, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, muscle yeah. centric medicine. And her, right, what's her, how does she say it? You're, we're, you're, not, we're not, we're not over, not fat. over fat. We're under muscle. We're under muscle. I mean, and we agree with that. Uh, yep. That's what we've been talking about for a long time. She's hundred percent right. This study is, proving um that she's right um i mean i i what's cool about this is i think this is going mainstream because this 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 study went mainstream right so big news organizations yeah, new york times picked right. it up yeah or, or picking it up and talking study, about it right? yeah, yeah and um that's cool because still today the average person would not consider strength training as a fat loss or longevity form of exercise they still think of it as like oh you build yeah you build muscle and strength maybe athletic performance but when it comes to health and fat loss, that they don't think about it. And so I'm glad that this is coming out because the revolution, right? That's mm -hmm. that's what we've been talking about. I think it's we're at the beginning of it. I think we're at the beginning of strength training getting um its uh, you know its due, right? Yeah. It's it's gonna get its due. It's people get the academic bump finally. Yes. So now it's and what's gonna happen? It's gonna take another five years or so. But yeah. uh, doctors are gonna start preaching it, and the average person is gonna start. Uh, you know, applying strength training. And, and I know what will happen in the beginning. It's going to be done wrong. It's going to be a bunch of circuits and all that stuff. But eventually people are going to figure out like, oh, in order to do this properly, I have to train like those, you know, meatheads that I thought were just meatheads or whatever. But that yeah. seems to be the most, you know, that's that's the way to, to, to do this. Um, I, I wonder if this, uh, how this, uh, you know, I didn't read it as deep as you did, how, how this can support the case for, uh, the um, empty stomach, you know, walking on the treadmill in the morning time before your day starts mm. versus the guy or girl who gets on the Stairmaster and bangs out an hour. I mean, this is how fasted cardio. Yeah. So, and I, I don't even like calling it fasted cardio because I'm not hitting my cardio threshold. It's walking. 
It's low Just level. Movement. It's low level intensity, steady state. It's like literally walking at speed three point two on a treadmill, which is a little bit faster than casual stroll mm -hmm. on a treadmill for an hour. First thing when you wake up, fasted like that was the amount of cardio cardio training I would consider doing when I was competing. Yeah, but I think, and you've brought this up, uh, I think the benefits of it, I mean, it's good, it's activity, right? It's the early movement. It's, it's, it's getting up an hour early and moving. It's the behavior yeah. that it encourages, right? It gets you to move as soon yeah, as you wake discipline. up, which you know studies will show if you wake up and start moving, you're more likely to move uh, later on, unless you beat yourself up in the morning, uh, in which case it's the opposite. Um, also sets the stage for more consistency and discipline with your diet. So when they do studies on exercise, what they find is when people start working out consistently, a significant percentage will also start simultaneously working on their diet. It's not true in the reverse. People who start to diet don't necessarily start to go exercise as a result of it. So I think it's the behaviors, really. I think waking up, it also encourages you to probably go to bed early because you know you're gonna wake up and do the walk. Yeah, I mean, you get up, you get up earlier, which is also makes me tired at that night. I get up, I start the day with walking. Right, this isn't what I'm doing right now. This is what I was doing when I was competing. Right, so I get up, walk at six o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock. Why I'm walking, I'm like also like mentally planning out my day of eating. Yeah. Like the first meal I eat is a good healthy choice. Versus, had I not done that, could have easily slept in till seven thirty, eight o'clock slow to get going. Maybe I make a good choice. Yep. Maybe I make a bad choice eating first my first meal. So you're right. I'm sure there are, there's a lot of the psychology plays into that also, but I think it just supports that as being a better strategy than getting on a Stairmaster at, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon yeah. and, you know, sweating till I, you make puddles below I you. I think, and this is the case that, I, that uh, you know, we made in uh, the resistance training revolution. I think when you're talking about the average person, you have to, you absolutely have to consider minimum effective dose because you just you're not going to get most people to work out all the time yep it, just, it ain't going to happen everybody relax like the, the people in the fitness space who keep preaching this hardcore message of fitness you're only talking to fitness fanatics mm -hmm. that's the only people that are receiving that message the average person we did this for for two over two decades we trained people when i got really good i got to the point where i could get the average sedentary person to exercise structured exercise two or three days a week on their own. And that was like a massive success. And I'm talking about consistent, right? Now they're going to do this for the rest of their life. <clears throat> We're not going to get the average person to turn into a fitness fanatic. It's not going to happen. So we have to look at minimum effective dose. What do we do in the amount of time that's going to be realistic for the average person that's going to give them the most bang for their buck? Yeah. And it's in, in, look, you're not going to be able to string together multiple modalities of exercise in that. Well, you're just not yeah. strength training. Just, so, just, Oh, here, do strength training two days a week. And then on the other days, just find ways to be a little more active, not structured, but, you know, park farther away from the store, mm -hmm. walk for five minutes or 10 minutes after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, go for a walk, you know, with your wife afterward, after work, whatever, just those things right there. And the, the return that they'll get muscle is so protective that when you build it, it protects you from your normal sedentary, you know, modern Western society life. Yeah. Having more muscle is such uh, it, it, it's such a buffer against that. It's so important to do that unless look, you're going to live, I don't know, like a, like a hunter gatherer. I mean, good luck. You know, uh, you're not going to be moving all day. Nobody does. It's just, it's just too hard. You have to plan it. I mean, look at our job, even yeah. what we do we're in, we're in the fitness space and we're sitting down 90% of the time <laughs> while we're at work. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta be focused on planting seeds that, you know, grow within uh, these potential people we want to change. So it becomes their own intrinsic motivation, their own uh, pursuit. Like really the, the entire journey of it is theirs. I, I think that it, it's a weird thing as a fitness coach. We get this ownership over that and we, we want to like steer and control. Uh, and that only lasts so long, even if it does, uh, if they do accept it and, and they, and they, uh, and they, they get some kind of motivation externally from you, it's, it's very temporary. So, uh, you know, we have to like approach it a lot differently to be able to, to get that pull and to, to make those smaller uh, incremental changes is such a better way to look at it. Did you see my Instagram story the day that this came out, mm -mm. this study? Okay. So I, I posted about it and, and, you know, put, oh man, where did I hear this from? And did like a, a funny post of us and then, you know, referred to your book. Right. 
and I hadn't been on, I hadn't been on Amazon to look at your book sales in a long time and see like in the reviews, like it's got almost like a thousand reviews. And I think the average is like 4.7 or 4.8 out of five stars or whatever. And I actually went through and was like reading some of the reviews. I actually wanted to see the ones that didn't make five. Like mm -hmm. I wonder what people said yeah. negatively about yeah, this book. How dare you? you know, the irony of like what, what <laughs> well, the, the ones that people that start at four. So like everybody five started, some people four started. So it gave it an average of 4.7 or 4.8. Do you know what the what the one thing was? No, this right here, cardio. Cardio. Oh, oh. I, the people would say things like, "Oh, this was a phenomenal book. I love everything in it. I agree with most of it." You know, that would be like a four star. Yeah. But you know, I, there's some things I don't agree with in regards to cardio. It was <laughs> cardio was like the one thing that people still can't hang on to. They cannot grasp that. How could this be possible? Why would these fitness guys be recommending that as a as a the primary fat loss tools to be strength training and to ignore it's the really cardio burned strategy. in the cultural. It is like, I, I just thought it was so funny that, uh, like how many people were raving about the book and that's the one thing they just don't want to accept. I just look, I want to be clear. Like if I could construct the perfect, you know, routine, it would include cardio for the average person. It would have strength training as the foundation. You would have cardiovascular conditioning in there. You would have mobility and flexibility training. There would be yeah. a, uh, a, a awareness practice, something like meditation or prayer or some kind of a spiritual, you know, that bring makes you present. That would be in there as well. Yeah. And then there would be like sleep and lifestyle. I mean, if I could construct something perfect, then then that's it would include all that stuff. But we got to stop preaching perfect because it doesn't exist. It just doesn't it's, exist. Yeah. So what we need to do is tell people if you're going to do one thing, which is probably, which is we're lucky if we get you to do one thing and maintain it and your goal is to lose fat uh, reduce your risk of diabetes, reduce your risk of, of cancer, improve mobility, yeah. give you the best shot at longevity. Well, oh, and make you look good. What and it supplements feels good, like weight training the, the most yeah. mobility. Yeah. I would argue it's even more valuable than cardio. Oh yeah. And so, and that's not even a thought anybody has, no. you know, and it's, it's just one of those things. It's like, uh, I, I think it's something about it being mindless you know, like the cardiovascular, yeah. we could just like get in the rhythm. Like I like that. I just like, so, like it's a psychological thing. I think that is the draw for people. Well, there's oh, a I think there's the, there's a, there's a physical and visual thing that's going on with it too. I mean, if you eat less and go run your ass off every single day for two weeks, the scale will go down yeah. and you'll look smaller. That's yeah. too, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So there is, the, and that's the major disconnect. And that's why some people are so staunch about arguing this. Like, oh, these guys don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. I mean, I, I lost 15 I lost pounds, 15 pounds yeah. last month yeah. running like crazy yeah. every day. It's like, and so in their head, there's no way you're going to convince them otherwise that this is a better strategy. Now, what we know happened mm -hmm. to that person who lost 15 pounds by cutting calories and running every single day is they lost 80% muscle. And so they really didn't get any healthier. You know what I'm saying? All they do is, and they lost a little bit of body fat, but they also lost equal amount or more muscle. So you're not in a better place. You think you are because you went down a pant size, but you're not a healthier version of yourself. You're arguably healthier when you were heavier. So yeah, it's yeah. like trying to convince that person that has, felt that and physically seen that is the is probably one of the greatest challenges well, we're talking that we have. Fat it's a big loss. hurdle we have yeah we're talking fat loss not weight, weight. loss yeah, yeah, yeah big yeah. difference yeah very big difference just weight and muscle also you know you don't want to just build muscle you want healthy muscle you know what was illuminating was when we talked to Dr. Gabriel Lyon she said you know we measure lean body mass but we haven't had we do now but but a lot of people don't have access to them we never really measured muscle quality. Yeah. And she used this wonderful analogy. She said, look at a ribeye steak and look, a, look at a filet. What a great visual. Yeah, like, like having fat within the muscle. And she says, now athletes will as well, but that's access for energy. It's very different than a sedentary muscle that's peppered with fat within it. A fit, healthy muscle has less of that and it looks more like a filet. So now all of it measures a lean body mass. So that's the thing. So before, right, with, with normal um, testing. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the amount of muscle you have. It's also the quality of muscle. And then that's a storage vessel for glycogen, which comes from carbohydrates and sugar, which, you know, look, you, in, everybody talks about insulin resistance and its effects on health. Um, you know, a significant, there's a significant percentage. It's not a majority, but it's a large enough percentage where it raises eyebrows. A significant percentage of people who develop type 2 diabetes are not overweight. They're not even overweight. Mm -mm. They're like normal weight, and yet they develop this issue that we we attribute to obesity. It's not obesity. It's sarcopenia. It's loss of muscle. It's the muscle. The or the, it's a the hormonal muscle uh, uh, organ of muscle is not healthy, or you don't have enough of it, and this is what's causing a lot of those issues. And then that causes issues with 
the rest of the body, um, especially increasing cancer risk. You look at the cancer reduction risks of uh, building muscle and it's profound. I think it's like 25% drop across the board hmm. just from building muscle and doing nothing else. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up the point that like, if I were to construct the perfect, healthiest, fittest version of myself or my client's day or routine, of course, it would include all of these great Everything. practices. It would include cardio. It would include spiritual gratitude or prayer. It would include, but you know, it's so funny. It's like the way I look at cardio is in that same realm of spiritual spirituality. It's not like somebody who was 200 pounds overweight came to me. I'd say, you know what? Just go home and pray about it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And let me know, get back to me in a month and see how that goes. That's where cardio gets in, 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 in that journey for me. It's like, First, I'm going to tell the, the client the big rocks. Like, let's let's address building muscle. Let's address balancing out your nutrition. Then when we get those rocks in, it's like, hey, maybe we'll add a gratitude practice in there. Oh, maybe we'll add some, some cardio once or twice a week. Maybe we'll start adding these other things that is going to enhance your health, enhance your life, that have tremendous value. But there's an order of operation of what matters most in the pursuit of being a healthier version of yourself. And cardio is not at the top of the list. You know what? The, another challenge with uh, cardio for the average person uh, is that they perceive it as a simpler form of exercise because they go, well, I could just go run. Like I could just go lace up my shoes, go outside and run or ride a bike. Not realizing that that those physical activities are skills. They've never been taught how to run. Properly. Yeah, and if you haven't run a lot since you were 12, and now you're 35 mm -hmm. or 40, and you decide you're going to run to fatigue, first off, your technique's already off right, right. out the gates because you never run. So right. you stopped running when you were a kid. You don't run anymore. Now you're going to go run, and then you're going to run to fatigue. First, your form's already off anyway, so stuff's going to start hurting. And then you get fatigued and stuff gets even, your technique gets even worse. Yeah. This is why the injury rates are oh, so high. Your knees go, then right. it goes to the hips. Now, the beauty of strength training, although it seems more complex. Now, the truth is there's a lot more variety with strength training. There's a million and one different ways to do different exercises. It's super adaptable. I think that's a strength of it, not its weakness. However, here's, what's, here's what I, I think is great about strength training. People typically, not always, right? Because if they do a class like body pump or circuit or whatever, but typically, if they go to strength training the real way, like I'm going to go get stronger, there is an emphasis on technique. There is an emphasis on form. There's a right way to do it. Whereas with running, it's like, well, let's just go run till we're tired. All right, John, let's go. And we're going to mm -hmm. go until we're, we're totally tired. And then the injury risk goes to the roof. So I think there's this misconception that it's this easier, safer maybe way of, of working out. It's not. Um, running is a skill. You lose that skill. It's going to take a while to build it up. I used to tell my clients uh, who decided that they wanted to train for endurance sports. And, and there was a place by my studio where there were running coaches there. And they would actually record you running, find the right shoe for you, and then they'd coach you. And I'd tell them, look, if you came to me and you said you wanted to compete in powerlifting and you've never lifted weights, I'd tell you, well, if we want a good chance at this, let's train for six months to a year first and really perfect <coughs> things. Make sure you can actually squat and deadlift and press. So I told them, go hire a running coach and train with them until your running technique is so good that even when you get tired, your form doesn't break down too much. It would take them a year to mm -hmm. get to that point. And then they could run without developing issues. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're asking for trouble. I think we just overcomplicate this. Uh, I think it's not. I mean, literally, uh, deadlift, squat, overhead press. I'm going to make the big five, three. Go practice those three movements and start with a weight so light you feel super safe and comfortable with it until you get the technique down. And then slowly add a little bit more weight yeah. every time you show back up and do that. You do those three movements and you practice them in the gym with a weight that you feel comfortable with doing that you won't hurt yourself and you slowly add weight every single time you come back to the gym because you, you build confidence in that movement, you're going to see profound changes to your body. Do that literally three times a week. Practice those three moves. Or even how about this? Uh, you know, home gyms are getting more popular. Now I know they take up a lot of space. Now there's companies like PRX that literally design them. They have equipment designed specifically to use minimal space, like very minimal. It folds into the wall, the squat racks, and all that stuff. It's pretty cool. I think the average person would benefit from doing like two exercises a day. Mm -hmm. Like go out to the room with the rack, get the barbell. Three sets of this, three sets of that, done. And just do that every single day. I think that would benefit the average person more than anything. Oh, I mean, 100%. I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll just take three days. I won't, you know, every day, I'll yeah. take three days. Three yeah. days of those yeah. three movements, or you can divide it up over six days and do two and two. Yeah. However you want to do it. But like I just said, there's a, there's a, a, a million different ways we can set it, put it all together. And the, and the problem with our space is we argue so much about like, 
who's more right about it. And we use these studies to try and prove yeah. our points. And it's like, meanwhile, we lose the masses of people that are so intimidated to start moving in the right direction because it seems so complicated. And who do I follow? And whose program should I do this? And what diet should I do? It's like, dude, cut out processed foods, eat whole foods. Don't even worry about how much, just eat whole foods. Literally just get rid of the, the process shit. See what happens there. Hey, do these three to four exercises. Just practice them. Don't worry about sets and reps and weight and how many days of this. Like, just practice them. Get good at them. Yep. And then once you get good at them and proficient at the movement, add a little bit of weight. Then after all the results that will come from that, the, the you eliminating processed foods and practicing those movements, because you're going to get, I'm telling you right now, for the next three to six months, you're going to see results just from that. Yeah. Then when those start to slow down, then go invest in a program. Yeah, now we then dial go, it in. Then go look at your, find your favorite fitness person to tell you how to get more nuanced about everything. But for right now, yeah. the, just doing that will make massive changes in 85% of the population I right know. now. I know. E easily, yeah. I know. I love it. I love it. I think it's great. I think uh, we're about to see mainstream start to adopt this, um, which is exciting to me. It's exciting because I remember as a trainer, God, do you guys remember noticing this in gyms when you were, when you first started you go into, and I look, by the way, I'm going to say this like straight up. I thought for a long time, cardio was the best way to burn body fat. Yes. Okay. As a trainer, like you, if you had asked me mm -hmm. when I became a trainer at 18, probably till the age of 24 or 25. Okay. So for a while you asked me, Hey, Hey, I want to lose a lot of weight real fast. I only want to do one form of exercise. What should I do? I probably would eh, probably cardio. You should strength train too, but probably cardio if you really want to lose body fat. But what I kept noticing in the gyms were my group X instructors versus my female trainers or my members that would come in regularly to hop on a treadmill and a bike versus my members that would go into the weight room, men and women. And they just, it just, they look different. They look so different. Like the people who strength train consistently, their bodies look different. They looked leaner. They looked healthier. Um, it, it didn't look like it took as much work. My group X instructors, they would bust their asses teaching class. I mean, like hours of cardio a day, teaching classes and doing stuff. Then I have my female trainers who lift weights once, you know, once a day for an hour. And they just looked very different. And then I told you a story. I've told you a story before. I had a, I had a, a trainer <coughs> and a group X instructor both have a baby right at the same time. And it was cool because they come in pregnant, you know, do the whole thing. Obviously, the female trainer lifted. Group X instructor, just a bunch of cardio. The recovery from the pregnancy with the trainer was insanely fast. Like mm -hmm. she came back. So, and then the other, the, the group X instructor obviously did better than the average person. But I remember it took her a lot longer to come back. And what it was, was it was the muscle. Yep. It was the muscle. Well, I, I was so misinformed as a trainer doing this. I mean, I remember I would put clients on a bike as hard as they could for seven minutes. Then I'd pick up the weights and do three exercises back <laughs> oh, together. God. Then I'd put them back on the bike yeah. as hard as they could for seven minutes. Yep. And then I'd yep. get them back. I mean, that was like Training cycles look like that. It was crazy. That's how I was training my clients, all in this yeah. pursuit of burning calories like yeah. crazy. And I'm doing weights, right? So we're going to build, like, so terrible. But I see this all over Instagram still. I mean, it's yeah. still prevalent in our space. People that have massive followings showing these exercises where they're doing dumbbell lunge to curl to press and then doing jump rope in between or burpees in yeah. between. It's like, what are you doing? It's like, there's, so, and the irony is that the better, more effective way is actually less work. <laughs> that's the irony of it. Maybe that's what makes it so hard to believe. It, yeah. it is. Maybe that's actually the weakness. It is because everything else it, in life. It's got to be harder than that. Everything else in life, the more you put in, the harder the work, the better the return is. Typically, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, name something else like that's not like that. Yeah. I mean, if you 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 work harder at school, you get better grades. You study more for the test, you do better on the test. You you know, you practice a skill in a sport as much as you possibly can. You get better at, the, I mean, there's very few things where you're like, listen, it's actually like a sweet spot. You don't want to overdo this. You want to do just enough and you're going to get more yeah. results and you can technically do yeah. too much. I guess chemistry. And, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> a little too I much. Mean, I explode. can't think of, I yeah. can't think of another really good example. Well, you know what it reminds me of Adam is, uh, um, you know, we, after I trained people for a while and I trained these really, <coughs> really wealthy, successful people. And, um, it, they would be like, you, you know, I remember one guy I trained, he's like, you could try making a lot of money per hour and work a lot of hours because you're not going to get wealthy like that. Very few people are wealthy making money, m making a lot per hour. He goes, the way you get wealthy is you take that money and you put it somewhere and it makes money for you. That's how you get wealthy. And I remember him making that big point. And he, I remember he showed me on a, 
on his, he had a, uh, uh, we had a calculator and he I did the math. He's like, okay, fine. You make this much per hour. Look how many hours you can work. We're going to work more hours. Yeah. Or I could take that money and he would show me compounding interest and stuff. Mm -hmm. This is when I was young and it kind of understood it. And some of it went over my head. I mean, that's a good example because I, I mean, that, or that resonates with me because I remember being fixated on types of professions that would pay me more per hour yeah. or had a big salary and uh -huh. like, Oh, I got to get there. I got to get to the point where I'm making a hundred, 200, 300,000. I was so focused on that. And then I remember reading the book millionaire next door and seeing the things that most millionaires had in common was not their profession. Yeah. And in fact, things like teachers and engineers and these professions that aren't making millions of dollars a year were actually the most amount of millionaires. So it had nothing to do with their salary yeah. every year. It was that they had the, the, the ability to live well below their means, yeah. use their extra income to invest it in things that had compounding interest and then made money while they slept. Yeah. And they just did that for years over years over years that turned into decades. And that all grew and grew and grew to the point where their passive income surpassed their the income. Building muscle is your compounding interest. Yeah. 100%. It does the work for you when you have some more muscle. And the beauty is, you just got to get, send the signal, feed the body properly. And then the body does the work for you. It's actually what happens. Your body builds the muscle for you. You don't have to sit there and build it. Yeah. You just send the signal. And then when the muscle's there, it's like having money in a, oh, yeah. a got wonderful- all the flexibility at your disposal. Yeah, you got compounding. Answers. You just, you know, it's like, it's like yeah, imagine you have this amazing account. You wake up in the morning, pull it up. You're like, oh, I made another five grand just yeah. going to sleep. That's what happens when you have more muscle. You literally you just, oh, I woke up. I burned more calories than I did last week because I got a little bit more muscle. Oh, my insulin sensitivity is better because I built a little more muscle. My my question was, uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm getting a little bit older, almost fifty, and uh, I can, you know, I can get my weight to fluctuate, you know, kind of how I want. I can go up 10, 15 pounds here and there, but I'm always stuck with this, you know, little tummy that kind of never goes anywhere. Uh, you know, I'm I'm in a deficit. I feel like I'm kind of doing all this stuff that I'm supposed to be doing. You know, just kind of found you guys and, uh, you know, have been listening very intently to all your good advice. So figured I'd call the pros. Yeah, no good. Uh, so first of all, you look phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, so you, you said you're almost 50. You look like you're pretty lean now. Do you know what your body fat percentage is at? Uh, I've done a couple of the like, uh, scans at the gym and stuff like that. And, you know, they'll say, you know, I've had it as low as nine, but, uh, you know, as high as 12, 13, I think I'm probably in the you know, 14, 15% range. Okay. Have, have when, you, Josh, did you, sorry to interrupt yourself, but I just, this question is like, I remember when this happened to me and it tripped me out. So did, have, have you been listening for a long time or just recently? Yeah. Yeah. A real long time since you, I got out of high school. Do you remember, do you remember, um, no, 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 listening. Sorry, it sounded like I said listening. Listening, I'm my God, listening to the show. Oh, yeah, listen, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I got a cold right now, so it's my bad. So did you, uh, have you been listening to the show for a long time? Uh, no, probably just like maybe a month. Oh, okay. but, you know, I'm kind of banging okay. through your podcast. And stuff. Okay, okay. So I, so I've had this, I remember when this happened to me when I was getting ready to compete and it would trip me out because I was like really lean and I still had like this this pooch and this this belly fat that like everywhere else in my body looked lean. And really what what I attribute that to is just, I, I'd never gone leaner than that. Like kind of 9% was like the lowest I'd ever been in my life. I'd never done like six or five or something like crazy shredded. Oh yeah. And I found that even when I got all the way down, I still had this tiny bit left over. And then I, and then I bulked up and I came back down and it took like three times of doing a good clean bulk and then cutting a little bit lower then getting clean, clean bulk, then cutting a little lower until finally I hit a body fat percentage I'd never seen before. And that was the last place that it went. And it's still the first place to come back. So like right now I wouldn't, I'm not in the single digit body fat percentage so that I carry body fat right there. So it just took me pushing to a, a, a level low enough to finally get rid of that area. And everybody has this. It's just a different area. It's for everybody. Like it's like an area where, you tend to get the body fat first and or if you carry any body fat, that's kind of where it, it it hangs out. And until you get to a, a level of leanness that you've never seen before, it'll probably kind of always stay there until you go even lower. And so if you do a good job of getting leaner than you've ever been, and then when you come out of that diet to get you that lean and put on good good lean mass and you don't go binge afterwards, you can get rid of that and hang hang tight with that. Like after I competed, uh, that was gone for a really long time. Now, again, I've 
gone up in body fat percentage. So of course it's back, but I know what I have to do to get rid of it is I have to take my body to a leanness that it's, it just doesn't see what, where, when you were at 9%, what did it look like in that area? Was it gone or did you feel like you still had some? Oh no, it, it, it looked identical. Like it yeah. just, it, it never seems to, uh, yeah. never seems to budge whatsoever. And, okay. uh, Okay, Josh, what Adam's saying, so look, the, the first place you gain it's the last place you lose it. Um, everybody has that spot. So you're going to have to try to get below 9%. And it's probably, you probably were ripped everywhere else except for there. So probably another percent or two from there, then you'll see that body fat come off. But I'm going to help you out a little bit as well with maybe optimizing your hormones a bit. Now this is, we're starting to split hairs here. Okay. But, but we are already splitting hairs with this question because you've got down to the lead. Yeah. You already look phenomenal. Yeah. So most, <laughs> mo yeah. Most men will not get to 9% body fat. It's really hard. It's a hard thing to do. Okay. So I'm going to give you two pieces of advice that I think will help. One is aesthetic. And the other one is literally to address the body fat, the stubborn body fat you see. So let's start with the aesthetic first. When I, uh, for years would get down to a low, you know, single digit body fat percentage, I didn't have a six pack. It wasn't until I built the muscles of my abs that I could see the six pack. Now I got a six pack at 12% body fat. Whereas before at 9%, I didn't have a six pack. Now, why is that? Well, when you develop the muscles of the, of the core, they stick, the they stick out. Tightens they, the skin around that. Yeah. And it just stick out. You got visible muscles. So, um, most people, when they train their core, don't train their core in a way that it builds the muscles because we tend to believe the core for some reason is different than the biceps or the back. And so we do super high reps and low respiratory. So what I want you to do is pick, um, high tension core exercises. Just give them no BS. I am. Okay. So I'm going to give you a, a program that's specifically designed to build the muscles of the core. And the idea, now form is crucial, okay? Because if you go heavy and then your form is crap, you're just going to build your hip flexors. But the program, I, I really break down the form. I want you to do exercises where you're doing like eight reps for your abs, where you're like building the abs. And then what'll happen is they'll stick out more and you won't have to get as lean to see it. And it'll look, you'll look a lot leaner as a result. Now, here's the second part to address the belly fat. Now, this is splitting hairs. But again, because you've already gotten so lean, this may be an, uh, effective. I noticed in your question, you said that you have an eating window between two to eight. You do that every single day? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, just with the way my lifestyle is, you know, that, that ends up kind of being what it is daily. Okay. Every once in a while I'll have a breakfast, but usually not. Okay. So, uh, again, this is splitting hairs, but we do know that, uh, cortisol tends to promote fat storage in the midsection. Okay. And we can see this in people as their hormones start to change as they get older. Women really notice this because they go through menopause, big hormone change that they start to store body fat differently than they used to. So it's like all of a sudden, you know, they used to store it a particular way. Now they're storing it more in their belly. And they're like, what the hell? I used to just have it on my hips and my thighs. Now it looks like it's on my belly type of deal. So hormones can influence where you store body fat. The way that you get cortisol to go down, one of the ways is to eat. Okay. You want to eat. So if you wake up in the morning and cortisol is supposed to spike in the morning, but you don't eat, uh, you may be encouraging the levels to stay high a little too long. So what I want you to do is eat a protein fat meal or two before 2 p.m. It doesn't have to be a lot. It could literally be, you know, three scrambled eggs with some cheese. It could be a protein shake with a scrambled egg for the fat. So a fat protein type meal with a little bit of carbs. Insulin opposes uh, cortisol. So you could throw in some fruit there one or two small meals and do that while you're doing this process that we're talking about. And then put yourself in a calorie deficit. And the, and the way that you should do the deficit to maximize what you're looking for is a three to one ratio of cut to maintenance. Okay. So you'd be in a deficit for three weeks, do a one week of maintenance, three week deficit, one week maintenance. It's a slow process, but this is going to ensure that you don't lose Tons of muscle. And can of course, I, strength train the whole time. Can I can I counter just a little bit of that? Yeah. Just a tiny bit. Like I everything he's saying I'm I'm on board with. I actually would like for you to run the no BS six pack program we're gonna send you in a in a bulk for a little bit to help you first. Build, yeah, first yeah, a good idea. To build the abs and then then follow that advice. Like so maybe like a four week Yeah, four weeks. Bulk. Four week cycle, 
following the maps, the, the no BS six pack abs we're going to send over to you. Get Try and build your abs like you never have before. Like you're trying to get them strong. Yeah. Follow that program to a T to build your abs in a slight calorie surplus. So you're trying to gain at this point, but not a lot. You're just trying to stay hot, well-fed, or a little bit above, right? So don't worry, but we're not worrying about body fat percentage. We're not worrying about weight right now. Yeah, I love this. Then transition to exactly what he said and go in a cut and then take yourself to a leanness you've never seen. I guarantee if you go 1% to 2% lower than you've ever been before, after you do that with the No BS app, you will you will see this go. It'll go. Yeah. Promise you that. Yeah, That's jo the Josh, I, uh, I mean, I've experienced the uh, same thing. Like, I, uh, for me, I'll get lean in my arms, shoulders, legs. That's first. Then I start to get it off my obliques. Then it comes off my back. Yeah, low back. And then the last place for me to lose it is right around my belly button. And it is what's crazy. Say yeah. okay. And what's crazy about it is I'll get down to, I don't know, 10, 10 ish percent body fat. And then every percent I go down off that, it's like it comes right off that area. But up until I get to about 10%, it doesn't move. It's like it's the same. Everything else gets lean and veiny. And I got this little bit of stomach body fat. Then I get down like 10 ish. It's like every percent, like I go down to nine, eight, seven. It's like, oh, it's all coming off that area. But the, the approach we're giving you is the one that's going to minimize any muscle loss. And again, we're going to try and build the abs. And what you, what might happen if you do this right is you'll get down to nine, 10 percent. You won't need to get any leaner because yeah. the, the midsection will be more developed. It'll just look leaner. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, taking my call. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got it, man. Yeah, keep us posted. I'm curious to see how this goes. This was a, a really uh, stubborn thing for me, and it took me a, a long time to figure, piece this together. It didn't happen until I was in my 30s before I finally figured this piece out. What does so. your normal workout look like, by the way? Because we're going to send you the ab program, but what does your normal strength training look like? Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I lift every day. I just kind of do, you know, I kind of settled into this routine where I just go do a little bit of cardio. I lift, you know, 45, 50 minutes. And then uh, I hit the sauna, and then I'm out of there. Okay, and uh, are you when I'm lifting, I'm uh, you know I'll do like back one day, chest, uh, oh, arms, that's... core, shoulders, kind of. Oh, bro! Can, um, we, can we just do like a, just keep it rolling? Can you if if we give you another program, will you follow it? Yeah, because I think if you did maps anabolic in yes, combination with yes. the ab program, they work perfectly. Yes, and, and it, it's. It, it's so different from what you're doing right now. Yeah, it'll you'll a, get some muscle. Gain it'll be a novel it. stimulus, which will really help build muscle during this four week bulk and then, and then do the cut. Here's how you combine the two. Okay. There's foundational workouts in both programs, alternate the foundational workouts. So one day it's maps anabolic foundational workout. The next day it's the six pack program foundational workout. The next day is maps anabolic. So it's five days a week. You'll be in the gym. Two of those days will be focused on the core. The other three are full body. And I think it's novel enough where you're going to see some muscle gain with yes. that too. Okay. Yeah, I love changing it up, but I also, I can definitely follow a routine, man. And I can just get in there and grind on it. So, okay. perfect. Okay. whatever you guys recommend. Yeah, I, yeah. Yo, if you I trust the process right here, we got you. I yeah, promise. We'll, we'll send those to you. Yeah, I, I trust you guys. Awesome. Right. Thanks, Josh. I'm sorry, what was that? No, no, we just said awesome. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yep. You got it, man. All right, take care. Take it easy. So, I, first of all, I want to, I love the fact that we get to do that every once in a while because that's such a unique question. Yeah, because he's and, figured out, it looks like he's figured out a lot of the other stuff. Oh, yeah. And, it's, and that's the part I wanted to make clear to the audience, right? Because sometimes uh, we don't talk about stuff like this. Um, and there's a reason why, because I think 90% of the people don't need advice in this direction, right. right? They think they want this advice because they- But they haven't figured out the big rock. That's right. Now. And and so he's kind of an exception to the rule, right? The guy looks incredible. At, I mean, and if he was my client, I'd also be reminding him that, right? As we're training all the time, like, hey, bro, you know you look really good, right? You're yeah. 50 years old and you look fucking phenomenal, right? So, but, you know, hey, you got a lot of things dialed in and, and you're curious about uh, that. And I, I've experienced that personally. So I know it's like Same. to feel, feel like, hey, man, I'm so lean, but this little area Same. just won't go. It's always the inner thighs. <laughs> <laughs> Last to go. Right, For you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody, I really hate it. Where do you store most of your, your, your 
You know, you're like, I mean, you're obviously built like everywhere. A tank. Is it really just evenly yeah, dispersed? It's just, it's just all over. It, <laughs> it actually, it, you know, you actually do. Uh, you, you know, that's part of why I think you look good fuller. Like I, like if if you and I increased our body fat percentage the exact same amount, yeah. you look way better. Adam would I. just get a belly. I would, I just, <laughs> I, and I lose my arm, like my arms and legs go, and then I get a belly. It's like just the, like a, a bleh. blob of clay that just yeah, like exactly. you, yeah. you, just you add five percent to your body, and it looks evenly distributed. Bro, I will. Literally, you're that, you know what? You're like the chick that all the chicks hate. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it goes right to your tits, tits and ass. You ever, all your body fat goes to your tits and ass, yeah. bro. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> I got plenty of junk. <laughs> junk Dude, in my trunk. it annoys. Listen, when I would mess with this, literally, this is how I, my extremities get cross striations yeah. before I would get a six pack. Like cross striations of my quads. Yeah. Yeah. I get striations of my glutes, but I got a pooch. Of this, no, this like, tripped me oh. out because uh, I had never really been below like nine, 10% yeah. body fat. Yeah. And, you know, so even, and, and I remember as a kid, like, so as a kid, like my abs was my thing, right? Cause I didn't have arms. I didn't have legs. Might so as well have abs. Yeah. So I'd be like, you know, <laughs> show, show your abs off all the time. And then I got yeah. older, put on a little bit of body fat. And then when I got lean like that, it just stayed right there. And I was like, what the fuck? And I was shredded. Like just yeah. like you said, striation in my legs and arms. Yeah, and, was, same here. <laughs> and then I had this little, this little pooch thing and it didn't go. <laughs> Until I hit body fat percentage I'd never seen yeah. before. And then you know? you know what's weird about this? This is all observational. Zero science to support this. <laughs> Once you get rid of it, it's easier to do it afterwards. It it's oh, almost yeah. like... Probably has to do with white brown, white fat, brown fat. Maybe it moves into something easier. But hmm. once I got rid of it, it was easier to get rid of each time. Well, I I agree too. And also, what happens is you get that shredded. So you finally you force the body to go find any last bit of body fat you have anywhere because mm -hmm. you get to so low a body fat percentage. Then, if as long as you stay on your routine and training, when you add back the calories, it gets partitioned to building muscle. It's it weird, yeah. It doesn't go there. And so, if you can, if you can get rid of it and then stay consistent with your training yep. and not overindulge on the diet, you you should be able to maintain it off. Obesity is not a disease; it's a result of choices and your lifestyle. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's not a disease. Don't buy into this crap that they're starting to sell now in media. And with Western medicine, so there was this. Uh, this is that making its rounds again? Yeah, about, uh, disease. They've um, been trying diagnosis? to. They've been trying to push that narrative for a long time. And there was this. Um, I don't know. It's like documentary style uh, episode on CBS where this doctor was being interviewed, and they were talking about how obesity is a disease. I want to be very clear with with uh, first off why I think they're pushing this so hard. Western medicine is imperfect, just like all forms of medicines. There's things that they do, they do very well. There's things that they do very poorly. One of the things that Western medicine does poorly is treat chronic diseases or chronic issues or challenges. They treat acute things very well, but chronic things they treat very poorly, especially things that, that are, require lifestyle changes. Also, uh, this is not a surprise to most people, but the Western medicine is driven heavily by its biggest producer of revenue, which is the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical. industry. What always follows... When something is determined to be a quote unquote disease, what always follows is a medical treatment. Right. And this is part of the game. Part of the game is it's a disease. It's not a result of your lifestyle. It's not a result of your choices. It's not your fault. But don't worry. We have the drug. We have the drug. Isn't there some new um, drugs coming out? To yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There, there are drugs now that are out and now new ones that are coming out sense. that actually effectively cause people to lose weight, mainly through appetite. But well, actually that's really the issue is through appetite suppression. Um, and so I think this is all kind of going together, but look, here's your evidence for the reason why it's not a disease. Didn't exist. Um, not that long ago. Obesity was rare. Not that long ago. It's, it's it was a, it was a wealthy problem. Is that true evidence? So, I mean, there's gotta yeah. be some cases where diseases come out of nowhere that we didn't have before. Right? Well, if you, if, if, if the disease is the result of your lifestyle, can you call it a disease. In other words, if uh, let's say smoking increases by you know five thousand. No, I don't. I mean, I don't disagree with you, but I don't know if what you said is evidence. Is that it, because it didn't exist before and it exists now? Well, is that truly evidence? That's a good so. question. So, or a good good statement. So, uh, what does a disease imply when someone says this is a disease? It implies that um, it's you have no control over it. Yeah, or very little control. Oh well, yeah, little control. Yeah, there's nothing I can do. This really isn't something Some that genetic factor, or it's yeah, something it, like that. Exactly. Um, and if you go back just not that long ago, a few generations, obesity was extremely rare. Um, it's literally the result of our modern lifestyles, and and I don't want to downplay this. 
um, our it's not easy at all. It's not easy to live a modern in a modern world and not become obese. Everything's actually designed to, to promote that, but it's not something that you can't do anything about. We've worked in this field for over two decades. You could definitely solve this problem. It's just going to take just work. Takes work, yeah, and it's challenging. Do you, and, find, do you find it interesting that this is this is resurfacing at the same time as the the article that's going viral right now too? With the the gyms are ran by like white supremacists. No, and they're racist. man. <laughs> I mean, what was, I shared that article that it, that uh, exercise uh, the white supremacy roots of exercise. That's right? what it was. Yeah. That's what it was. There's a propaganda. Um, Right, like, it, listen, it's, it's a disease, right you can't now. help yourself, and oh, by the way, gyms are racist anyways. Like, isn't that weird? It's kind of like all coming around yeah. the same time. Like, what's the, and then you have- Creating the, this hostile kind of vision of what, like, exercising entails. And then also, I shared the article with you last night, the, the FDA is about to approve some, like, super weight loss drug. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, don't, you know, don't go to the racist gyms, and oh, it's a disease, oh, let us help Just you. Take and, chemicals, we'll, we'll solve it for you. Yeah, no, listen, um, it's, uh, if you take away people's, ability to empower themselves and to, to affect positive change themselves. If you take that away from them, what you're left with are very manipulatable people. You have people now that are easily manipulated. When somebody does something for themselves, they care for themselves. They feel a sense of autonomy. It's really hard to, it's harder, I should say, to manipulate them and to make them scared. <clears throat> and the attack on fitness is uh, all part of this thing that's happening that seems to be happening right now. And they're going to attack fitness. We Look, I'm glad we had the podcast because it's all recorded. We, I called this out. I've actually predicted this as I started seeing these articles start to surface that they're going to demonize fitness. They're going to demonize improving your health. They're going to call it uh, fat phobic. If you want to lose weight, that's hating your body. It's self-hate and it's hating yourself. And I, I understand that you can hate yourself in a way that will make you try to lose weight. We've talked about that a million times, but uh, that trying to pursue a healthier lifestyle is not a fat phobic, uh, self-hating thing. It's a self-care thing. Um, it, racist origins of, of, you know what's funny about this? You wanna know, I'll, get, I'll use, this is gonna be real controversial, I don't give a shit. Uh, if you wanna talk about roots that are racist or roots that are whatever, why don't they attack uh, Planned Parenthood, whose founder literally was somebody that promoted, well, what's the term? Eugenics. Eugenics, yeah, yeah. eugenicists. Her, this is her quotes. Mm -hmm. Her quote, why don't they attack that? Because it's not, their propaganda has nothing to do with that right now. Right now it's about attacking fitness. And so what, is there truth to you know racist root? First of all, no, maybe in some cases, but that's not what fitness is all about at all. It's ridiculous to me. Yeah. So I think it's silly. But yeah, obesity is not a disease. Stop calling it a disease. You have so much control over obesity for yourself in very, very rare cases, is it something that you literally have no control over? But you have so much control over. That doesn't mean it's, it's easy. It's hard. And it's hard mainly because the world is organized in a way where being obese is the default. And being fit and healthy means it requires, you have to plan it out. Yeah, like You have steps you have to take in order to prevent it. Yeah, like yeah. overeating was something that was hard to do in the past. Now it's so easy. Food's so accessible. It's so palatable. It's, it's engineered to make you overeat. <clears throat> Activity was like the default before, like you're going to move because you got to wash your clothes. You got to, you know, maybe hunt, you got to build things like you're going to move. Now you have to schedule movement because everything's so sedentary. So that's all, that's just what's happening is you have to now organize ways to get yourself to be active and plan and create disciplines and uh, around nutrition in order to live in this modern lifestyle. That's, that's really what you it is. You have to be an advocate for yourself. I mean, and that's uh, everything else out there really is, is going in the opposite direction and, and creating these um, solutions for basically all of our struggles. And meanwhile, the struggle itself is like where we get most of the benefits. Uh, and so it's, it's interesting for me to see how that's like really just taking over all the landscape now we're, of any kind of struggle. We're going to have to seek it more than we ever have. One thing you can do that will significantly impact, in a positive way, muscle growth, strength, recovery, and fat loss. Steroids. Literally, not that. It's one thing only. One other thing. <laughs> and that is to improve your sleep quality uh, and even sleep a little bit more. Just doing that alone, most of the time, will get your results moving in a positive direction. So if I sleep a lot, I'll look like Arnold. Not, <laughs> not exactly. Oh. Uh, no, you know what's, you know what's uh, interesting about this is for the vast majority of people, 
because most of us have suboptimal sleep or we have some days where they're great, maybe not so great other times. And we're really good at, humans are really good at, at operating at suboptimal sleep. So, and once you get used to it, you tend to think I'm okay. But literally, I used to do this with clients. If I just focus on their sleep and had them do a sleep routine, had, to, had them really schedule that they're going to sleep you know, for eight and a half hours, make sure that, and we'll get into this, make sure that on the weekends they keep the same schedule so they don't get jet lagged on Monday and we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. You would see fat loss start to happen, libido start to go up, strength start to go up. I mean, it's such a, it sounds so simple that I think a lot of people just discredit it because it's like, ah, it's sleep, what's the big deal? Yeah. I feel okay. But no, it makes a huge difference. And you have to change anything else, just that. You know what's interesting is there's like a saying, like abs are made in the kitchen. Yeah. You know, why isn't there like a muscles are made, uh, you know. In the bedroom? Uh, yeah, in, in the bedroom or at night or sleep. <laughs> well, I don't know, like weird. you guys come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> there's no catchy phrase for that. But it really is like that's where all the magic happens. Obviously, you're going to stimulate it throughout the day and, you know, put the work in. But your body needs um, you know, all of the, the active building materials and everything. And then the, the proper amount of recovery is really what takes you, uh, to that place you want to go. Okay. So if this is true, would you stand behind an argument like this, that building a good sleep, sleep routine and, or even utilizing good sleep aids that help you get a better night's rest could result in more muscle than even something as 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 powerful and as well studied as something like creatine. Yeah, for your muscle building goals. Yeah. It, okay. So poor sleep. Let's go in the opposite direction, right? Poor sleep has a profound effect on your hormones, on your anabolic hormones. Studies will show that like one or two nights of poor sleep in men will dramatically lower testosterone. Cortisol goes through the roof in both men and women. You see this imbalance of estrogen and progesterone. Growth hormone is thrown off. So just the hormones alone. You, you, saw, you start to see problems. Memory deficiencies happen with one night of poor sleep. Insanity happens with, I think, like three or four nights of no sleep. They've done studies on this where you actually start to, like a, like a large percentage of people actually start to become insane. Mm -hmm. It's such a, a powerful thing. First off, uh, this, this gives you a hint as to how essential sleep is. Evolution hasn't figured out how to get rid of it. And you might think, well, why would evolution want to do that? Well, think about it. For eight hours a night, you're doing nothing. You're not gathering food. You're not building shelter. You're not hunting you're or protecting as yourself. As vulnerable as can be. You become unconscious. If sleep wasn't one of the most important things ever, evolution would have figured out a way to keep us uh, from not sleeping. But almost every creature that I think that we know of sleeps in some way, shape, or another. It's extremely important. And uh, lack of sleep has been shown to change behaviors. So lack of sleep increases cravings for certain foods, changes, uh, influences our impulsivity. Um, and a lot of people think, well, yeah, that's if I get like really terrible sleep. But it could be like, you know, ideal might be eight hours of sleep and you get seven every single night or six and a half. This is actually where people tend to fall, about six and a half hours of good sleep. And I know what people do is they look at the time they go to bed and then they count the hours from there. That's actually really what you want to do is count the time you fall asleep and then when you wake up and it's usually takes people about 10 to 15 minutes to really start to fall asleep. So you want to add that in there. And I tell people to aim for eight and a half hours of sleep because then we tend to fall back to about seven hours and 45 minutes or eight hours. Um, now here's the other one. This one's a huge one that I didn't figure out till later. I don't remember where I heard this, but this, I don't remember who it was that said this, but they said, you know, it's funny. People go to bed at let's say 10 o'clock every night and then Friday night, comes around and they're like, oh, I'll sleep in Saturday. So I'll go to bed at midnight and then I'll go to bed again, you know, one o'clock in the morning, Saturday night. So I'll sleep in on Sunday. And then Monday comes around. They got to wake up early for work. Everybody feels like dog crap. And it's because you literally created jet lag. Jet lag. Yeah. It's you've the same exact process, right? You've, you've changed your <laughs> circadian rhythm yeah. and that takes like a couple days to adjust. And you're doing that to yourself every single week. So uh, like one massive powerful hack is to go to bed and wake at the same time every single day, even on the weekends. It's like diet. It's like everybody's good Monday through Friday with their diet and Saturday, Sunday screw up and they can't figure out why they can't burn body fat. Same thing with sleep. Now, I asked the question about the comparing creatine to like sleep aid type of supplements because today we have a commercial for Ned and I know that they just recently created another sleep aid uh, product yeah. and Mellow has been like life-changing for me as far as uh, my ability to fall asleep and then get better quality sleep. 
Um, do you know, my, I haven't tried the product out, so I don't know anything about it. Like, I just know it's part of their sleep, their sleep category mm -hmm. again. I think I saw that it has magnesium in it, which that excites me because I think that was obviously what was so, so powerful for me in mellow that made such a difference. So it's got that and in and, and conjunction with some other, uh, herbs and stuff. What's yeah, it, it's what's up it? there. So, okay. So here's what's, uh, so just on that note, so I gave my parents, um, mellow and I had them try it and they, my mom texted me this morning. She's like, do you have more of that? Like your dad and I are getting some of the best sleep that we've had in a long time. So mellow is phenomenal. The difference between Ned's mellow and their new product called shut eye chai is that the shut, shut eye chai, chai also has mm -hmm. ashwagandha, chamomile, it's got uh, dandelion root. Um, it's got the theanine, but so does mellow. And it's got the magnesium, but so does mellow. So what it what they've added to this were these kind of natural adaptogenic compounds known to help relax the body. Now, these are different than like taking something that makes you drowsy or, you know, uh, kind of in, like melatonin or something like that. These compounds have adaptogenic properties. They actually help the body deal with stress. They're not themselves. Like you can have chamomile and ashwagandha earlier in the day. It's not going to make you fall asleep, but through using them on a relatively consistent basis, it does improve your body's ability to deal with stress. So it's, that's why it's called an adaptogenic. Yeah. Um, and it improves sleep through that process. So it's, it's like mellow, but then they've put these other things in it uh, to make it even more, I guess, long-term effective. Now, pardon my ignorance, but uh, in terms of chai, is chai specifically a spice or is it a combination of a bunch of spices? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe Doug knows. I don't know. The, How do you not know that? I mean, I know what chai <laughs> tea is. It is a combination of spices. Uh, and that's what they put in here, like cardamom, cinnamon, clove, that type of thing. Yeah. So, But I don't know the exact, you know... Uh, ingredients that typically go into chai. Okay. I like the taste. Yeah, because I was talking, actually, I got a chance to to talk with the guys from Ned at our Christmas party quite a bit. And what's cool about what they do is they really want to get like a hands-on with any of these products. They usually go wherever like the, the source or the root of it is. So okay. they actually went to India. They went to India? Yeah. Uh, was, that's cool. Is it Hassam or I forget the region of India. Um, but uh, they traveled all the way there and like he was telling me all these crazy stories about who they met and like what kind of spices they tried through that whole process. But it was like a very hands-on experience that they had with it and then we're able to source you know what they really yeah. liked that's, that's what cool. i like about so here's some answers for you oh thanks okay. uh, yeah. so chai is actually the hindi word for tea so there you go oh. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay but typically the traditional way is to take black tea mix it with strong spices like cinnamon cardamom cloves ginger black now, peppercorns now doesn't tea normally naturally come with caffeine too or depends on the type of tea so i'm assuming this doesn't because that wouldn't no. make a lot of sense to have that caffeine. would be terrible yeah right? We put caffeine in our sleep formula. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought most I thought most chais actually naturally had caffeine. If in it. black tea has caffeine, green tea has caffeine, but like uh, like chamomile. Yeah. So I would say it's more chai spices that they put right. in there. There's no tea that I can see in this. Yeah. So, ah, so. You know, I'll tell you what. Um, it's what's interesting about this is, and I ignored this forever as a kid. So I, you guys know, I dived into like muscle building you know, methodologies. And I dived into like how the old time strong man worked out and how did people, what did they say to do back before, you know, even anabolic steroids existed and supplements existed. And they always said a few different things, all of them. They all said, eat lots of, uh, like eat lots of meat and eggs. And they talked about drinking milk and heavy cream. They talked about training the full body three days a week, not beating yourself up. They would say things like leave some in the tank for not in the tank, but they, they use different verb verbiage, but basically allow yourself to be able to work out, out hard again a couple of days later. And then this is what they always, always said to prioritize restful sleep every single night. Which one of those things do you think I ignored as a kid? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. The last but they all always. said it every single one. You read any book, any, any publication from the late 1800s, early 1900s, and by the way, these strong men or, or these strength athletes had feats of strength that would blow anybody away. Like if you, like a one arm bent press with 300 pounds, like that's mm -hmm. a barbell above, like above your head with one arm, 300 pounds, like insane feats of strength. They looked incredible and they all emphasize like good night's sleep, good night's sleep, good night's sleep. What do you, th what do you think it is that, that keeps us, I mean, 
we've known it for forever and it's not like even when i became a trainer like i didn't hear that it wasn't like it was a new science that oh you get great sleep and it makes yeah. a huge difference why do we tend to ignore that if it's that powerful that beneficial towards our results and goal why is it never even make anybody's top five list of what they focus there's on? a few different reasons this, this is, is actually so productivity driven well it's not yes and there's a few different reasons it's really interesting when you look into this when electricity was invented so before electricity was invented the sun went down, it was dark, and you used candlelight. But if you've ever had a house lit up by candles, it's kind of dark, and it does make you sleepy. People used to sleep a lot more. Mm. They also were much more physically exhausted. So yeah. people were ready to go to bed at 9 o'clock. Now, we're so physically inactive today that you get this kind of wired, you know, kind of wired, tired uh, energy. Um, and if you've ever been on a computer all day long and it's time to go to bed and notice you can't sleep, that's kind of what's happening. They got more sunlight, so we get less sunlight. Um, and we have more ways to fill the time. Back in those days, when it was dark outside and you had candlelight, like, what are you going to do? You're going to go work? You're going to go, well, you're not going to really do anything. So I guess you could read a book by candlelight. You ever try to read a book by candlelight? You're going to be asleep in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now you got TV, you got your phone. In fact, with uh, like tablets and phones and computers, sleep has gotten worse not better because people are are keeping themselves up. So you combine all those things together and it's like we're we're this like walking zombies, you know? Like I do yeah. this to my kids. I see my, my son will will complain about not being able to sleep even though he hasn't been doing anything all day long. I'm like, "Oh, it's cuz you haven't seen the sun. So you're like a vampire." Right. And you're not physically so I'll take him on a hike, have a move, go outside and then I'll be like, "How did you sleep last night?" "Oh, I slept really good." Yeah, it's that it's that weird combination so that like wired energy that that you don't uh, express. And then, you know, and then that kind of just, it's this low level kind of stress you just, you just carry with you and it goes with you into the next day and then the next day after that. And it's, it's interesting to me. And two, like, uh, in terms of like your immune system, like, you know how it is when you're run down, oh, right? Yeah. It's like, you're I just susceptible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for, and so there's just all these effects of like not being fully recovered that, uh, you know, our body and then not getting sunlight on top of that. It's like, we're just working against our, our body I, right now. I see a huge difference. It's one of the worst feelings is to feel, uh, mentally exhausted but not physically exhausted it, yeah it is yeah. like a recipe for the worst sleep ever i've many times have felt where you know we especially when we do these things where we talk a lot where we talk for five six hours in a day like i've got a <laughs> headache i feel so and we're in here with the electric yeah, yeah. Lamp but i haven't us. done anything really physical and so my my body is not that exhausted but my mind is and so then you lay there and you're so restless and then you get this awful sleep even though you feel it's like so you should be oh it's the it's the worst i yeah. know a huge difference and then just simply getting a good workout earlier in the day and getting outside for just a small period of time makes a, a tremendous difference so think of it this way today you have to go out of your way you have to plan to be active yeah. in modern times. Yeah. That this wasn't the case not that long ago. A couple generations back, you know, if I if I told my great great grandfather, yeah, I go lift heavy things and put them down, and he's like, well, what are you building? Well, I just do that for myself. He'd be like, this is so weird. Why are people doing this? Because that's what I do for yeah, work, are, right? Are you mental? <laughs> yeah. So you have to plan physical activity. You have to plan to not overeat. This also didn't exist not that long ago, and sleep was not something you had to plan to have. Uh, be good in the past because it just happened. It got dark. Like, try this out. For anybody who's, who's, who's listening to me, try this out. Do something really physical all day long. Then when you come home and it gets dark, don't turn on your lights and use candles and tell me your ass isn't going to be asleep by 9 p.m. Yeah. It just naturally happens. Yeah. So my point with all of this is you have to plan to have good sleep. That means you should have a sleep routine. So maybe two hours before bed, you dim the lights or so what I have, or I have uh, Himalayan salt lamps. I have these little night lights and salt lamps and we dim everything. And so it's just kind of nice and dark and glowy in the house. That makes a huge difference or where, you know, blue light blockers is, is another alternative. Um, I don't eat right before bed. I wait at least an hour and a half or two hours before. And then I'll use supplements or things to help like things with magnesium and theanine, which help calm the brain, help calm the mind. Um, and if you do that on a consistent basis, I promise you, you'll you'll notice brand new gains in your body. Strong, in fact, do this for two days, and I bet mo many people will hit close to PRs in the gym. It just makes a huge difference. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out.